these crosses are sold at a really high premium and it's because they're new and you think that they can improve, but obviously you don't know how they're going to come out because you don't know who sired them. And that goes back into how we have to be intentional. Welcome to another episode of the Beef Podcast Show. I am one of the co-hosts, Dr. Stephanie Hansen. I'm a feedlot nutritionist at Iowa State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome a graduate student from Michigan State University as our guest today. Melanie Pimentel Concepcion is a, as I said, a graduate student working on her PhD at Michigan State. She also did her master's at Michigan State, and she's going to tell us today about a lot of her uh, really cool research that she's done with some of the dairy beef crosses. And she did her undergraduate degree at Puerto Rico. So maybe we'll hear about that as well as a part of her origin story. So welcome to the show, Melanie, and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the beef industry. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think my origin story is very similar to a lot of people in the animal science world right now, or at least the younger people. Um, I wanted to go to vet school. Um, and after I started my bachelor's in animal science and I started taking all these classes, um, I didn't know that it was going to be so ag-based. I thought it would be more domestic animals, but I actually fell in love with it. And I initially even wanted to go into the dairy side of things, but I ended up taking a feedlot class, a beef intro class in my undergrad, and I really liked it. Um, it was really interesting. And after that, I did an internship or practice um, over there in Puerto Rico in a Charolais feedlot. Um, so kind of different of what we have here. It was Charolais and Brahmin cattle, and they also had sharp braid crosses um so that was really interesting and that kind of like interested me a bit more and more in the beef world and i ended up applying to michigan state under dr dan buskirk because there were several professors i had in puerto rico that went to michigan state and eventually i even figured out or found out that one of my professors um was um under him when he did his phd work in Michigan State. So that was really cool to find out that someone that taught me classes was also a student of my current advisor. Um, so that's how I ended up in the beef world, I guess. Um, I applied to Michigan State, I got in, and then they already had this beef on Holstein and Holstein project um, funded. And I just ended up working on it and I really liked it. Um, I'm really passionate about it. And we're going to keep working on this now with my PhD. We have more beef on hosting projects. We have a time and labor saving product for you. Beef and Dairy AgriSlat by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With Beef and Dairy AgriSlat, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit MyHealthyFarms.com. Um, well, I so agree with your comments there about how important those um, undergraduate beef classes are. We were just having this conversation amongst our faculty at Iowa State this week, talking about, um, so at Iowa State, we have a 200-level beef science class and then a 400-level like capstone beef course. And when I was an undergrad, a million years ago at Iowa State, we only had the capstone class and they then they split them later. And we the reason they did that was because they wanted to engage the interest of the sophomore instead of waiting and making it this like ultimate capstone experience till you got your big beef class. And that's, I think both on the beef and the swine side and poultry, we see a lot of kids who come in who just have not had the benefit of having that exposure. Mm -hmm. It's all small animals for the most part. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, I could be a pig kid or I could totally see how cool <laughs> the beef industry is. So I think it's really cool to see how many professionals we're seeing now come into the beef industry that are a function of not necessarily growing up on a beef operation, but they got there through the education. Awesome. And I'm also picturing your like Charlay Brahmin feedlot. And I was like, I bet, I bet back home that that's just right for some heat tolerance. Yeah. And another thing is that um, when I took my beef intro course, they always talked about Brahmin cattle being really temperamental. So when I started working there, I that's what I envisioned. But it's all about 
how you handle cattle, which is another thing that I kept learning after I got here. But while I was there, those Brahmin cattle were the sweetest cattle ever. They would walk up to you so you could scratch them and pet them. And then the crosses were even better. Um, so I really loved having that experience and being able to also experience it back home. It's really hot there. It's really warm. And then you get here and it's such a completely different system. They were also on pasture. Here we have um, feedlot systems. So it's really interesting to see um, the different sides of the beef industry, not only when you're talking about pasture systems or feedlot systems, but also um, the environment, because I was in a more warm and comparable to the southern side of the United States. Um, and now here it's like the eastern side. It's really cold. It's It can be wet. It's just a complete 180. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, speaking of animals that will come up to you and try to eat you in the feedlot and in the good way, not the bad way, um, or maybe it is bad if you're trying to get a dairy calf to move away from you. <laughs> let's talk about some of your master's work. Um, so let's just start at the beginning because this is a big project and that's kind of going to be our main focus of our discussion today. Um, start by telling us a little bit about the personnel involved, the kind of objective of the project, and just sort of lay out high level your experimental design for us. And then we'll kind of work through it piece by piece. Uh, Melanie presented these data in place of her advisor, um, what was that, a couple of weeks ago now, yeah. um, in January of 2024 at the Driftless Beef Conference. So there might be some proceedings that somebody could look up from there. Or um, as we go, you can tell us about some of the publications that you're getting out of this as well, if producers want to go look it up. Yeah, so actually, and I'll start with that, um, our paper on this was published at the start of February. Um, I talked about it in the conference that it was in press, but it's officially published and it was actually um, picked as the editor's choice for the Applied Animal Science Journal. So it'll be really easy to find if they go on the website, but we also have an article on Beef Magazine. Um, so we have put out quite a bit of information on this out there because we know it's really relevant and people really want to know about it. Um, and I think this is the only study that looked at beef on Holsteins um, in this um, type of setting right now. So I know that it's really good information to have out there. Um, but going back to your first question, this project was proposed by um, what's considered the beef team at Michigan State. Um, so my advisor, Dan Buskirk, Dr. Dan Buskirk, Dr. Jared Deborek, Dr. Janine Schweighofer, um, and then we also had Dr. McKendry, who she, was, uh, she works more on the economic side. Um, and then we also had Dr. Arno Arnold Henschel. A lot of people know him in Michigan and probably other places. He's really smart, and he's probably the person that... Um, pushed a lot for this, this project to get funded. He had the idea and after that they developed it. Um, and the idea with this was that we know that beef on dairy cattle were increasing around that time. This was funded in 2021. Um, but we know also that we have a lot of Holstein steers that come from the dairy, um, that come from the dairy side into the beef side because they're this co-product and they make a really big part of the beef industry and they're not really bad quality. It's just that because they're Holsteins, packers don't really love them. And we know that Tyson several years ago stopped accepting them for harvest because of all the discounts that they can incur and also the issues that can come from their frame size. We know that if they drag, they can get condemned, they can just incur in a lot of costs for the industry. Um, so the idea with these crosses is that they can improve the already existing Holstein steer by making all of these things that may make them seem as difficult to deal with, you know, improve that, um, improve their muscling as well. We know that Holsteins don't really have a lot of muscle. Um, and then you can also take advantage of other things like their marbling. Um, we know that beef cattle have good marbling, but Holsteins have really good marbling too. They make up like 30% of the prime quality grade in the United States. So um, this 
seen like an opportunity to combine the best of both both worlds, which is what we do with crossbreeding um, in general. Um, and this makes me think of an article I read a few years ago, and I'm almost sure that this was written by someone at Iowa, Iowa State, actually. Um, they referred to Holsteins, uh, to, uh, to the beef on Holsteins as Black Holsteins, because towards the start of this production system, people were not being very intentional about their selection criteria when it came to crossing beef to dairy. So you were just getting these crosses that were black, but they looked like Holsteins anyways. You weren't getting that improved muscling or um, that improvement in frame size. They were still pretty big. So it was just a Holstein that was black. You weren't getting anything that could benefit you in terms of, like I said, muscling or even get premiums like certified Angus beef, which is one of the aims of our study. Um, we were not able to get that premium at the plant because of the way that we sold them. But we did do, and I spoke about that in my presentation towards the end, we did do several different pricing scenarios that were a little bit complicated. Um, but within those scenarios, we looked at what if they would have um, gained that premium for certified Angus beef. And if they would have, that would have added a bit more value to them. Before we get into the economics, I, I just kind of want to go piece by piece, because actually one of the things that I thought was really interesting about your study, um, and you just led us up into it really nicely, talking about the different breed types that we might cross on a Holstein. Tell us about your genetic testing and what that ended up looking like. Be and, and start maybe with, if I remember, these would have been calves that your, or your, your calves all came from a single grower but that grower would have sourced from different dairies, right? So your steers actually came from different dairies. So they had different genetic backgrounds, but they had a single growing experience. Yes. Yes. So um, be, we, when we sourced these cattle, we knew that, that they were initially from different dairies. So we were hoping to obtain some sire data so that we could even calculate heterosis eventually. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to do that. And so we um, spoke with Soetis Genetics and they sent us some blood cards so that we could collect some blood from the tail vein. And then they did some genomic analysis. They came back to, back to us with some of the breeds. And I have it written down here, actually, because I, I knew this would be something that I wanted to talk about. So 35% of them were sired by Angus bulls, 27% by limousine bulls, 12% or 11.8 um, by Limflex, 7.8, so 8% by Simital, and the rest, which was 17.6% by Sim Angus Bulls. And I don't know if I did, if I mentioned this um, during my talk, but, but we only obtained this for 51% of the steers, not 51, I'm sorry, for 51 of the steers out of 60 um, from the crosses because two of them had already been removed from the trial at that point. And then the rest, we had some issues that that data was not able to be analyzed. But it was really interesting to see the differences in the composition of those breeds. So we initially wanted to source Angus Holstein so that it would be the same breed and it would be more consistent. But it did show us that some variability that we might have seen in those crosses was based on those different breeds. Because if we go more into that, we know that Angus is a British breed, but then Limousine is a continental breed and the same with Semitol, but then you have Limflex and Semangus. So it's like more crosses within those crosses. Um, so we know that some of that variation may have come from that. Um, obviously, because we saw this a little bit later into the study, it's not data that we were able to further analyze um, in that way and say like, oh, um, this was variable because of this and this and that. Um, but it was really nice to be able to have that information so that people know that even though they were not all the same breed, they did represent very well what we have in the feedlot industry here in Michigan, because most of the beef cattle we have is primarily Angus, but then we do have our Semitols and Limousines as well. 
So I am curious, and I think I asked you this at your Driftless presentation too. We'll see if you've done your homework. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious. So like you said, you think about Angus, you think about a high growing machine, also maintaining high quality. So what's the impact of having an Angus on that Holstein versus having something like limousine where we know we'd have tremendous muscling, less, lesser quality grades, but usually tremendous feed efficiency. And then let's call some until somewhere in between those two. So what was the effect of the genet- the beef sire on, you know, do you have, an, maybe you don't have enough power to even pull that out of your data set, but do you see differences in like, did you have more that would have been CAB if they came from the Angus sire or more that were like big ribeyes if you had them from like the Limmy sires? So um, when we looked at the data to see which ones would have qualified for certified Angus beef, Actually, only five would have met those specifications, but that's mainly because of marbling. I also spoke there that we did this on, we harvested them on an empty body fat basis, and we used an equation, and it overestimated by 2%. So we thought we were harvesting them at 30% empty body fat. It actually ended up being an average of 28%. So we know that marbling wasn't as wasn't greater. Um, as at least we were hoping for, to have better quality grades because of that. So that's why only five met those specifications. But out of those fives, um, three of them were sired by Angus. And then the other two were Limousine and Sim Angus. So um, I don't know how well that answers your question, but um, because it wasn't enough, I can't say... Um, which one would be better, but because three of them were sired by Angus, um, we also looked at out of those, um, out of all of those um, animals, which ones had at least the better growth rates. And while three of those that met the specifications for CAB were sired by, Ang- by Angus, the ones that had the better growth rates were the ones sired by limousine bulls or the Limflex bulls, which would be limousine angus, but it still has that limousine. Um, so I'd say that for growth rates, continental genetics may be beneficial. But then if we're talking about marbling, those British gen- genetics may be more beneficial. Um, so maybe also with these beef on dairy crossbreds, we may benefit from something like, and we have a study coming up where this is what we're doing. Um, we have a study that would be phase two of this where we're going to be looking at Sim Angus Holstein crosses. So we're hoping to see some of that there, that maybe we'll see some of that um, benefit from the continental and British genetics cross to the dairy breed um, and hopefully see some similar or even improved results compared to this study. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Well, I think it reinforces the point that um, you know, if we think about a beef dairy cross coming into the feedlot, if the dairy person is the person who's making the genetic decisions and they don't have any skin in the game in terms of how that calf performs once it leaves the place, potentially at 24 hours of age, um, that's a challenge, right? Because if you buy a calf and he looks he's black, but you got nothing else beyond that to really know whether there's Angus under the hide, like, you know, what's, what's the engine that's under the hood there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is this something that's going to grade or something that's going to grow? And depending on how you're marketing those cattle, you obviously need, need to know that. And I, I agree with you. I think this just hits on one of the, the single biggest challenges with the dairy beef cross. And I would say, there's a lot of people that would say liver abscesses are the biggest challenge, but I think not knowing what the hell you just bought is a big challenge. <laughs> But you looked at some of that. I was going to say, you just talked about liver abscesses. Um, this is something that I think everyone has a differing opinion opinion on it. When I talk to people, some of them say that liver abscesses are a problem with the crosses. Others say that it's not. But then there's others that are in the middle. And I think that's where I fall. I think it's a regional problem because if... Um, because if you talk to someone that's more on the eastern side of the United States, they'll see a bigger problem with liver abscesses, but more towards the west, they don't think it's a problem. They don't really see liver abscesses with these crosses, or even in general. 
so I think that also goes even further into even um, the feed as well. We feed a little bit different depending on where you are, depending on the weather and the environment. Um, so I think liver abscesses do need to be investigated and we're working on that right now. We have a study that's again, looking at beef on Holsteins and Holsteins, but we're feeding different diets, um, different inclusion levels of corn silage to see um, the effects of that on the eventual prevalence of liver abscesses, if there are any. Um, but then again, I think that because we're on, in Michigan, it's the East, maybe we'd actually see something. Maybe if we were doing this trial out in California, for example, we might not even see anything. So I think it's very regional. I think it might be a problem, but I don't think it's as big as what we were talking about with how we select to produce these crosses. Yeah, I think the liver, I agree with you. I think that was was well said. We've done a little bit of work with some dairy beef crosses where we were using them for a disease model because, spoiler alert, they really like to die. Um, <laughs> and we can talk about that too. Uh, but in, in that study, we were doing lots of necropsies and in none of those animals, um, well, we destroyed their lungs, but in none of those animals did we see signs of liver abscesses or even damage to the rumen epithelium. And those were 500 to 600 pound calves by that point. And so one of the prevailing theories is that their high starch pellet diets that they have through the grower phase is burning out those rumens. And at least in the ones that we saw, which is certainly not a huge data set, but you know we didn't see that. So I agree with you. I think there's a lot of regional specificity, um, multifactorial problem, liver abscesses. <laughs> Yeah, and also I think that's one of the things you just mentioned um, regarding how they're raised because we have different settings for dairy and beef cattle. I think the way that dairy cattle are raised, um, they are weaned and they automatically start getting fed these diets very early on compared to a beef calf that they're weaned really late into their life. They're still um, drinking milk and maybe chewing a little bit on the pasture, but they're raised so differently that I think a lot of that problem also comes from the setting that they um, start in compared to the beef calves. So I think that's also another really interesting thing to look at regarding um, the diet of these cattle because beef on dairy cattle are pretty much raised the same as a dairy calf, but if we raised it in a beef setting, that might be different too, even depending on the re region you're, you're on, you might not even see them if they're raised like a beef calf. So I, I think it's, like you said, very multifactorial. There's many things involved in that and it's not just one problem. So this study was a comparison of um, various beef sires on Holstein cows and then the calves that you use for that versus straight Holstein. So tell us um, kind of some of the high level, what were some of the live performance responses that you saw when you compared these two groups? And then what did those carcass data look like? So um, we looked at body weight, average chili gain, dry matter intake, and efficiency. And body weight was not different overall. We did start them on the same weight because we wanted that to be a similar basis. But throughout the study, we did see that the crossbreds had greater body weights throughout at some points overall from day zero to the end to finish. That was not different. Um, we did see a tendency for the final body weight for the Holsteins that it was a little bit greater, but it tended to be greater. It wasn't significantly greater, but that's because they stayed on feet longer, which is another thing that we usually expect from dairy cattle, they are going to remain on feed longer and they're going to eat a little bit more, which takes me to the dry matter intake. Um, if we look at it on a daily basis, that was not different. They ate the same daily, but overall, the Holsteins did eat more because they stayed longer, so they were still eating. Um, and then average daily gain did tend to be greater for the crossbreds. Um, they had a 1.70. Um, pounds, um, kilos per day greater, I think, than the Holsteins. And then they were more efficient. The crosses were more efficient than the Holsteins as well in converting that feed to gain. And then we also looked at frame size. 
we looked at hip, hip height and then we converted that into frame size. And that was really interesting to see because that's a one to 10 scale. And the whole scenes were almost at 10. They were like 9.4 or something. And then the crosses were at like seven point something, which we think that the beef moderated that frame size very well. Because when we looked at them side by side, you could see the difference. The whole scenes were way taller than the crosses. The crosses had um, more muscling, which that takes me into the carcass traits. Um, they were shorter, a bit fatter. They had more muscling. And I get really excited talking about it because that's where we saw the biggest difference, which is great because when we talk about carcass traits and beef cattle, we really want to have a lot of muscling. And they had a 20% greater ribeye compared to the Holsteins, which, like I said, it, it really gets me excited. It was really cool to see that um, because it was like I'm seeing a big difference. It's not like a uh, maybe small difference that turned out to be significant. No, it's pretty big. It was pretty notable. And because of that, yield grade was a great, um, well, was more desirable for the crosses compared to the Holsteins. And in my presentation, I only showed the averages, but I actually have it broken down here. Um, so the crosses actually had, 18% of them had um, yield grade one ribeyes and only 1.7% of the Holsteins had yield grade one. On average, most of them were um, yield grade two or three. But when we go down to four and five, the crossbreds had pretty much no four and fives compared to the Holsteins. It was like um, 1% and then maybe 10%. So that shows us how much more muscling these crosses had. And they had a greater fat thickness as well, which we would usually expect from beef cattle. So that tells me that the yield grade being greater for them um, means how much more muscle they had because they still had a greater fat thickness. And we know that that's really important in that yield grade equation, but it didn't really drive that yield grade down much. So my point with this, and I think I've said it like 10 times, is that they had way more muscling. They had bigger ribeyes and um, they just performed really better compared to the Holsteins in that sense which is what we're looking for. We want these crosses to be more beef type. Um, but then if we go into marbling, for example, that was not different. It was pretty much the same, but because we were looking at harvesting them on a similar empty body fat percentage, that tracks because empty body fat is usually correlated to a specific quality grade in marbling. So 28%, ended up being around choi low choice and select. Yeah. So and then because that's an average, we know that an average is like what's under and over. Pretty much all of them were low choice. So I'm curious on your ribeyes. Um did did the crosses have more desirable shape to their ribeyes? Because that's one of the problems with the straight Holsteins too, right? Is they kind of have this kind of like squished, elongated, yeah. not very pretty on a plate kind of ribeye. Yeah. So actually, and that's another thing I did in my presentation. And I don't know if um, it seemed a bias in a way, but I showed a side-by-side -side comparison of the ribeyes. And I had the Holstein and the crossbred ribeye and the Holstein ribeye was very angular. So I placed like a triangle on top of it to like emphasize that it was not very, I don't know, like that image showed that it was not very muscular. It was not very round. But then when I was looking at the beef on Holstein one, I placed that circle. It was more like an oval on top of it just to emphasize how how pretty it was because it was really pretty compared to that um, Holstein ribeye. It had that Holstein ribeye had that angle like this. It really looked like a triangle. And then pretty much all of those crossbred ribeyes were very pretty, were very desirable. Um, they were more attractive to the eye when you looked at them because they had that very round expression. Right. Okay. So cross is better for feed efficiency, at least numerically better for growth. You've got some differences in your slaughter dates, so that could be confounding some yeah. things too. Um, but then improvements obviously in um, overall, so I'm guessing dressing percentage was 
superior in the crosses based on what you've said so far? Like statistically, it was not different. Um, it was there was no difference statistically wise, but if we're just talking about numbers, the crossbreds had a one percent, almost two percent greater dressing percentage, which is actually not that great if you think about it, but we know that there's room for improvement there. Um, but I also personally think that the Holsteins in this study performed really well overall. And I said this towards the start. I don't think that Holstein cattle are bad um, meat products or that they perform bad. I just think that with this, we can improve what we already have. So we can improve that existing Holstein steer. So um, I think that they did really well because the average from the 2016 NBQA was 58% dressing percentage for dairy cattle. And in this study, these ones were, um, I think, around that same number, probably 57 to 58. So I think they did really well. And then if we look at those numbers, like spread out without actually looking at averages, I, I can say that a lot of our crosses were over 60%, but that average overall was not different, really, which is surprising because with everything that I'm saying, like you said, you'd think that there was difference and that it would be greater. Okay. So one of the things that would contribute to differences in dressing percentage would be the excessive carcass trim that might have to happen if you have adherence of abscesses in the liver. So tell us a little bit about your liver abscess data. Maybe start out by saying what you have abscess data for versus not, but tell us what you got. Yeah, so unfortunately, we did not collect any liver abscess data for the Holsteins because we had some problems at the packer that day, but we were able to collect it for the crosses, and 39% of the livers were abscessed, and then if we break it down further, we used the same um, scoring system that Lanco uses, where A has um, small, one or two small abscesses, and then A plus means that they had really big abscesses like or there were some adhesions to the carcass and around I have that number here yes so 23 percent of those 39 percent were a plus and I showed like you said some very nasty pictures of those abscesses um but I to me the most interesting one was the one where you couldn't really see the abscess you could only see that adhesion of like you could just see that trim from the um, carcass. And I think that's really important because like you said, that can contribute to dressing percentage being lower as well as um, decreased value to the carcass. So that's one of the reasons why if we think about liver abscesses, th yes, they are a problem. We don't know how big of a problem it is overall for the entire United States, but they're definitely a problem because that can just incur in so many losses um, to that carcass cost. And, and at times it can even cause that entire carcass to be condemned. In our case, that didn't happen, luckily. And I think not many of them had those adhesions to it. Like in that picture I saw, maybe like four or five, which may be a lot if we're talking about 60 carcasses. Um, but overall it wasn't, that many compared to the other abscesses I saw. But but yes, it is a problem. So the other unique thing that you guys did in this project was kind of some economic projections. Maybe we'll call it that. You kind of made up some of your own grids because of the way that you had to market the cattle. So tell us, tell our audience a little bit about what that what that is and then some of your results that you found that when comparing um, if you were feeding crosses versus the straight Holstein. Yeah, so we decided to look at the carcass data or the carcass economic data and in different pricing scenarios. So, and I mentioned this there, at the plant, they, the Holsteins were priced as Holsteins and the crosses were priced with a carcass price that was in between what they had for the Holstein and what they had for the beef-based carcass prices. So that's how they were sold. Yes, so based on that, that fourth pricing scenario looked at um, if they looked more dairy type, they were priced as beef on Holstein. 
And if they looked more beef type, they were priced as beef. But then what we added on to that is that those that looked like beef and were priced as beef were then um, we looked at and we looked into their data to see if they met specifications for certified Angus beef. And I should have mentioned this towards the start and maybe I didn't. Um, all the beef on Holsteins in this study met the color specification. So they were black and they didn't have, and I don't remember specifically what um, those places are that you can't have white right now. I know that it's pretty much like this area has to be black, um, but they met those specifications for color. However, um, the however the other specifications like marbling is what we started looking into when we had that knowledge that they look beef, so we're going to price them as beef. Um, and only five of those that met beef specifications also met the certified Angus beef specifications, so they got that premium. Um, but overall, in the other scenarios, they still got the yield grade and quality grade premiums. Um, it's just that in this one, we added that extra step that made it look a little bit more complicated. And that's why whenever I talk about it, I have to make the point of it might be confusing because even when I started working on it, I would get confused myself thinking about, wait, what is it that we're doing? Um, but I, I think that that was maybe the aim of what we did with those pricing scenarios, because that's the question that we get all the time. Can we get that certified Angus brief premium with these crossbreds? And I think that, yes, absolutely. And if we would have had them on feet longer, those empty body fat percentages would have been higher. Um, that marbling would have been greater. We would have had greater quality grades. And so we might have met that specification for marbling with more of them and we would have had a greater value in that pricing scenario because when comparing it to the beef scenario they were pretty much on par um they had pretty much the same value just a little bit lower because obviously we had some of them priced as crosses so that price is lower because that's the most important thing when you're pricing cattle at the packer that base carcass price is really what's going to drive everything because even if you add or take premiums, if that base price is higher than the Holstein one, you're already gaining a lot of value. Um, and that's really what we want. We want to have these Holsteins that we initially had. We want to improve them, but we also want to have more value. So that's why I said that that scenario was pretty much the aim of that part of the study just to see how much value can we add to them if they get to that point where they look more like beef than dairy and they are like a beef animal. So tell us kind of high level, what was the overall like differences in the value of these um, crosses versus the Holsteins kind of under some of these different scenarios? Yeah. So for those scenarios, we looked at carcass value total carcass revenue and break even. And for carcass value, all of the crosses in the scenario where they were priced as crosses, beef or variable, had a greater carcass value compared to the Holsteins. Those crosses that were priced as Holstein had a very similar value to the Holsteins. And again, that's because of how that base carcass price was the same. Um, Total carcass revenue was only greater for those that were priced as beef or in the variable um, scenario. So those that were crosses or Holsteins did not really have much of a greater revenue compared to the Holsteins. But then when we go into break even, all the scenarios had a greater break even compared to the Holsteins. And that's one of the interesting things about the study. So these crosses, are sold at a really high premium. And it's because they're new and you think that they can improve, but obviously you don't know how they're going to come out because you don't know who sired them. And that goes back into how we have to be intentional. But if you're the one doing the cross, you're going to be intentional. But if you're buying it, you don't know what you're getting until you get to that point at the end. So when we bought them, the crosses were $850 each. And the Holsteins were 540 each, which was already a high number, 
And tell us what age they were when you bought them at that price. So they were four months old. Because because I have we have paid well not me personally but others have paid eight hundred dollars for these stupid calves within twenty four hours of birth. Oh wow! Right? It's it's crazy. It is. Um, and that's because they're they're like they're a novelty. Um, we think that they can improve what we already have. But then again, you don't know what you're getting if you don't know who sired them, where they're coming from. We don't really know how they're going to be until you get to that end point of them. Um, and so we we were aware that it was a really high price, but obviously we had to get cattle for this study. Um, and then with those break-evens, we confirmed that that number was very high for those crosses because even when we compared... Um, how much each of those calves in each scenario had um, as a break even compared to those Holsteins. The difference between them was from $109 to almost $180. But then if we take $850 minus $540, that's $309. So the difference there is almost $120 greater than the difference that we're seeing when we're calculating the break even. So there was a really big disconnect in the market with that. And that's what a lot of people can say about these crosses. They're expensive and you don't know what you're going to get. So you're paying a lot for something that might end up being an expensive Holstein. Well, I think this has been really great, Melanie, just hearing about all of the, like some great data doing direct comparisons. That's super novel. Love that. But also just recognizing things like what's your base price, What's the packer going to give you for these animals? Just because it's black hide, it doesn't mean that it's going to perform the same as the straight beef crosses. I mean, that would have been, I'm sure you would have loved to have even more work, but it would have been really awesome to have a third treatment. that would have been some straight Angus calves, right? <laughs> to yeah. really see that all side by side. But I think there's been a lot of straight Angus and straight Holstein comparisons over the years. So you can, you can pull from that. So very cool. Um, loved hearing about your master's research here and glad to hear that you're continuing this in your PhD there at Michigan State. Um, wh where are you in your timeline in terms of your PhD? So I started it last fall. I actually finished my master's last summer. Um, so this is my first year. I'm still a baby PhD student. I have a little bit to go still, but I'm really excited for all that we're working on because we have a lot of things lined up in the beef on dairy world. Excellent. And before we jump into our final three questions, maybe still a baby PhD student as we record this in January, uh, February of 2024, but what do you want to do when you grow up? I would like to stay in academia. Um, so I'm actually um, also preparing to be a professor in the future. I help my advisor teaching. I'm a TA right now. So that's what I hope to do. I also hope to stay in the research world as well. So probably some faculty that's going to be really going crazy with all the classes and research, but that's what I want to do. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. It's time for our famous three. Okay. So you're ready for our three questions here at the end? Yes. <laughs> First question, what's a favorite beef resource? So I think I really like the LMIC. Um, I don't have an account for it. I usually just ask my advisor to pull things up from there. But um, I think it's really cool how much data they have there for everything, really, because it has a lot of beef data. But if you want to see anything about anything, it's there. Um, so I really like that resource. I also like the USDA pages as well. So tell our audience what that is. Help them understand. I want to make sure that I'm saying this right. It's the Livestock Information Marketing Center, maybe. I I think I, I butcher the initials sometimes, um, but there's so much information regarding, um, for example, auction sales um, and then prices for how cattle were sold. I like to look at how beef on dairy calves are sold. Um, across time because you can look at prices like for every day it's not even weekly because then if we look at those usda um, information that we have it's usually weekly or monthly so i like how they break that down into very specific so it's really useful data when you're going to talk about stuff like this excellent okay second question is what is a resource not related to beef that you're currently enjoying um 
So I really like, I'm right now I'm watching Desperate Housewives on Hulu. It's a really great show. So much drama. I love it. <laughs> that was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Keep us on our toes. Okay. Third and final question. What's a trait of someone you know that has helped them be successful? I'd say people that are very happy and energetic because it's easier to get through life when you're like that. Um, it's easier to make, turn everything and give it a positive spin. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I think that's good too. I hate negativity. <laughs> Okay. Well, Melanie, it's been really great having you on the Beef Podcast Show. Thanks so much for joining us. A uh, reminder to our listeners that you can um, interact and engage with us on YouTube or follow. Um, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Um, hosts are all on LinkedIn and our guests are often on LinkedIn as well. So thanks again for being on the show, Melanie, and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs>